Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the April edition of the Diversity Lecture Series of Winter 2023 at Grand Rapids Community College. I am incredibly excited to be here and to welcome you all into the room and into the space today. Um, but before we get started, we want to make sure that we acknowledge the real ways that the state of Michigan and Grand Rapids Community College and the residents of this land have benefited from the forced and systemic removal of the Ottawa, the Chippewa, also known as the Ojibwe and the Potawatomi. Likewise, we recognize that parts of what is now Michigan includes land within the traditional homelands of the Miami, the Meskwaki, the Sioux, the Kickapoo, the Menominee, and other indigenous nations. We collectively understand that offering land acknowledgments or land recognitions do not absolve the settler, coloner, co settler colonial privilege or diminish the colonial structures of violence at either the individual or the institutional level. We recognize that land acknowledgments must be preceded and followed with an ongoing and unwavering commitments to American Native and Indigenous communities. We affirm that Grand Rapids, as Grand Rapids Community College, we must support Indigenous communities and the nations in Michigan, as well as throughout Turtle Island and across the fourth world. We recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations for historic indigenous communities in Michigan. We affirm indigenous sovereignty and hold GRCC accountable to the needs of American native and indigenous people. A growing emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion has increased the visual representation of historically underserved and underrepresented communities on our campus. This is a long-awaited step in the right direction. However, when we focus solely on visible representations of diversity, we miss out on the stories that serve as the foundation for true diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging. This semester, the topic for the diversity lecture series has been intersections. And it's where we grapple with where our identities meet each other and what that really means. These stories are meant to challenge the status quo regarding diversity and the way we define it day to day. Our speakers for the semester are all local leaders in Grand Rapids. And today, we even have a GRCC alum with us. And they all identify as queer people of color. Each speaker brings their own unique experiences of how their identities interact with the world and how their identities intersect with each other. These speakers were chosen based on their similarities to each other as well as their differences. While there are lines that connect each of these humans beyond their identities as queer people of color, their experiences and expertises vary widely. In this moment, we pause in the traffic of the world to explore our intersections together. A huge, huge thank you to Steelcase for partnering with us on this semester series. This could not have happened um, without their generous support. Um, so I would like to say thank you to Kim Kuman, uh, who is here representing Steelcase. Um, I would invite her to say a few words, but she has declined. Um, so I want to honor that, um, but also recognize that she is here with us today. And without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. The Reverend R. R. Tavares is an artist, writer, and speaker local to Grand Rapids, Michigan. He is an Afro-Latino of Dominican and Puerto Rican heritage and proudly a part of the queer community. To his audience, he delivers a unique intersection of writing, visual art, and public speaking that reflect on race, gender, queerness, social justice, faith, and doubt. Tavares' journey into the arts and writing began as a youth as he initially discovered his gift for communication in both mediums. As he developed these abilities, his sensibilities to social inequities also developed, largely shaped by dwelling in community spaces home to immigrant and African American residents of his city. With his family deeply involved in their church and faith, his calling became clear in his life as he sought ways to bridge social action with a life of faith and devotion. Seeing the needs for leadership skills and development in his community, Tavares pursued an education that would allow him to invest those needed resources back into his neighborhood, empowering others to do the same. 
After graduating high school, he went on to earn an Associate of Arts in Business Administration at Grand Rapids Community College. Following that, he earned dual undergraduate degrees at Kuiper College in Bible and International Business and Marketing with a minor in Communications. Uh, finally, he acquired an MDiv from Calvin Theological Seminary with a concentration in missions. Today, Tavares writes poetry, essays, and short fiction. As a multidisciplinary visual artist, he uses photography, paint, charcoal, and graphite pencil as an extension of his storytelling. He is a recognized preacher, often bringing his storytelling methods to bear from the Sunday morning pulpit. As a reverend, he is a bivocational pastor leading a faith-based nonprofit called New City Neighbors as its executive director while pastoring in Vivo Church, a queer-affirming church plant he founded in 2016. He is a member of Grand Valley Artists and an artist with Art Exchange GR, and his creative tools of choice are pencil and paper in every area of his professional work. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Ricardo Tavares. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, several years ago, when I was attending GRCC, I would often make it a point to attend the diversity lecture series um, because I found it so enriching as an opportunity to just hear from different speakers, learn from different life experiences. And if you had told me back at that time that I would be one of your diversity lecture series speakers, I would have thought you were um, lying to me, quite frankly. <laughs> and so to be here in this moment, to come full circle, um, I just am really grateful for the opportunity to be here. So thank you to GRCC. Thank you to um, Erin and her department for the invitation. Um, and so I am just really excited to share um, some of my life experience in hopes that it will encourage and, and help someone else. So I want to start off with a poem, if you can indulge me for a moment. And I will just take a second to say that I, while my presentation doesn't include any of my artwork or, or photography, um, it will include a lot of story and poetry from vignettes of my life. This particular poem is called Progeny. Háblame en español, papi says, lying in bed, awake, eyes shut, super cansado, still in his work uniform. And so I try over and over, and so he corrects the long and short use of my vowels until I sound less like an Americano and more like him, a survivor in whom he is well pleased. Mommy is downstairs, living in the rhythm of rice and beans, rice and beans, rice and beans, rice, and on Sundays, yuca and platano majado, until the rhythm blesses my soul too, giving me the ganas to press on in the torrents written to erase my will. When Aaron approached me about being one of the diversity speakers for this series, she asked me the question, Afro, Latino, gay, and proud is how you describe yourself. How did you arrive there? I want to hear how you got there. Tell me that part of your story. And so as I thought about that, I realized it's not something that I have become, but rather something I am becoming. Michelle Obama in her book, Becoming, which I thought was appropriate to quote from, given the question, she says, now I think it's one of the most useless questions an adult can ask a child. 
What do you want to be when you grow up? As if growing up is finite. As if at some point you become something, and that's the end. She says, as well, for me, becoming isn't about arriving somewhere or achieving a certain aim. It is instead a forward motion, a means of evolving, a way to reach continuously toward a better self. The journey does not end. And so, if I could ask you to take just a few seconds to think about what are the influences that are making you into the person you are becoming. Today, think about it for just a few moments. What are the influences that are making you who are you, who you are becoming today? I think we need to rephrase the question and not ask, "How did we become?" Who we are, but rather, who are we becoming? Who are you becoming? What is your family of origin story? What does your education say? Your workplace, where you live, and anything else you can use to fill in that gap. And yet, even as we think about these things, we ter- we tend to segment them. We put them in separate boxes, and so we act one way when we're at work, act a completely different way when we're at home, and those things are、uh, become even more exaggerated when you have to add cultural nuances into the mix, code switching, race and racism, gender identity and expression. And so I think we need to enter into a journey of becoming a more whole and integrated self. And so that's a journey that I'm on. And part of that journey for me is responding to other questions that are tied into identity and intersections. The one that I have wrestled with the most consciously. Is this question here? How does it feel to be a problem? How does it feel to be a problem? This question—I didn't come up with it on my own. At least, not the phrasing. Certainly, something I experienced in my day-to-day life. But it actually comes from author W. E. B. Du Bois. He's describing. When he uses this question, his life experience as an African American man, with a good education, more or less, and living in the intersections of what it means to be a black man in America, and what it means to also inhabit spaces where he is not welcome. Let me read you a quote from his writing. Between me and the other world, there is an ever unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly framing it. All, nevertheless, flutter、uh, flutter around it. They approach me in a half hesitant sort of way, eye me curiously or compassionately, and then, instead of saying directly, "How does it feel to be a problem?" They say, "Oh, I know an excellent colored man in my town," or "I fought at Mechanicsville," or "Do not these Southern outrages make your blood boil?" At these, I smile, or I'm interested, or reduce the boiling to a simmer, as the occasion may require. The real question: How does it feel to be a problem? I answer seldom a word. He goes on to say, "It's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at one's self through the eyes of others, 
of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. His experience as a black man in America has a lot to say, I think, for in his time and also in ours. I resonate so much with what W.E.B. Du Bois is saying in asking this question. Now, he had a list of phrases that people come, were coming at him with. I'm just going to be feel free to be myself. <laughs> they would come at him in all sorts of crazy ways. Here's the ways that I've experienced people coming at me. Questions like, what are you? Where are you from? Where are you really from? And one of my favorites, where's your wife? Where is your wife? These are the questions that I'm choosing to respond to today in terms of identity and intersection and what it means for me in terms of becoming an Afro-Latino who is also gay and proud. So let me talk to you about my family of origin. So in different cultures and in different spaces, um, people ask about your family of origin in different ways. In my culture, I'm coming from an Afro-Caribbean mindset um, it is often, who are your parents? Who are your grandparents? Where are your people from? You might have heard a question like that before. In West Michigan, it plays itself out in a game of Dutch bingo, which I will not get into right now. I will say that I've tried to play that game and continuously lost, and so I found my own game to play. But who are my people? Who are my parents and, and my grandparents, and what does that have to say about my story? In my case, it has to say a lot. So Afro-Latino, short definition, I'm not going to lie, I kind of just made this up because it seems simple enough. There might be a more thorough definition on Wikipedia, is a Latin American of African ancestry, right? Part of the African diaspora that is from Latin America. So in my case, that would be from Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic, and I'm going to talk to you about my grandmother that is from Dominican Republic. Highlighted there in green on the slide, if you're looking at it, is the island of Hispaniola, formerly known as Haiti, which was colonized by Christopher Columbus and his comrades when they crossed the ocean blue in, y'all know the year. Yeah. We don't, have to, we don't have to acknowledge too much about it other than the damage that took place as a result. So here's another poem that I offer in reflection of my family of origin. Abuela, uh, sorry, the, the title is The Epic of La Morena. Abuela, that means grandmother, sweeps her hair back, ties it up. Soy fea, I am ugly. She says, such a common refrain. I watch her hands, weathered but unwrinkled, her fingers chorus a more ancient verse of waters pulled by an invisible moon onto a sand formerly known as unknown, formerly known as Hispaniola, formerly known as Aiti. These hands, they sing for days longer than her words of the epic called Morena, black. We used to have good hair, esta familia, this family, she says. Such an unusual instruction 
stay out of the sun, but the sun is where I play. Marry a white woman, but my sisters are morenas. For your babies, for the hair, but I delight in my waves. She tries to erase herself, powdering her chest. Her hands laugh at her, controlled but undefeated, with the divine wrapped in all their color. As we go, they hold me. When I cross the street, when we go to buy plantains, when we smash them, fry them, guiding my cursive when I learn to write, and when I say my prayers, searching for God. My grandmother was a black woman from Dominican Republic. Originally from the city of Santiago, she eventually moved her home or her dwelling to the capital city of Santo Domingo. When Columbus sailed over or traveled over the Atlantic Ocean, the city of Santo Domingo or the island of Hispaniola became the first place, the first destination of commercialized African slaves. I was watching a PBS documentary talking about the, the black and Latin experience and uh, the, the director or, or the person narrating described it as the birthplace of the black experience in the Americas. And I find that I have to explain this, by the way, a lot to folks in West Michigan because the, the institution of slavery, um, it's so at times nebulous in terms of its origin and, and the way that we teach it in history that we kind of miss points like this. Um, and I, I have found on more than one occasion that I have had to explain to people that Columbus did not land in the U.S., Right? And that says a lot about our education system and the way that uh, erasure plays out in the history of um, the African slaves and, and their descendants. And so my grandmother, a black woman, African descent, that's her picture there, by the way. It's not, I should have explained that earlier. <laughs> um, grew up hating herself because she was indeed black. In fact, she refused to call herself black and would refer to herself as India, which means translated Indian, because it was a way to put some space for herself between her and the descendants of the African diaspora. It was a way to put space between herself and the Haitians that shared the island she called home. This history of colonization has done such damage to us as people of color through racism, through racialization and colorism, that it's hard for us to even claim at times our factual identity. There are Afri African, uh, um, Afro-Latinos throughout all of Latin America, throughout the Atlantic coast of Central America, Brazil, Puerto Rico, Cuba, many other places. And even as, as they seek flourishing and, and try to thrive in those cultures, racism continues to play a part in the way that people are treated or discounted. I did an internship in Nicaragua um, doing some community development work back when I was in seminary. And I had the opportunity to travel um, all across the country and meet with several different leaders. Um, but there were two very sharp experiences that shaped the way I understood uh, the way the African diaspora is treated in Latin America and how it affected my own grandmother. The first is I came into the city of Leon and was staying with the host family. And um, there was a mother, a father, a, a couple of siblings, um, two daughters, and um, an aunt was also at the house, was doing some cleaning, and the daughter of the aunt, so a cousin um, or niece or nephew, 
um, was sitting there in the uh, living room as I came in. And she had heard about me coming from the United States to do some development work um, with people in her city. And as soon as I walk in the door, she comes up to me and says in Spanish, my family does not like me because I'm black. It was very clear that she was darker skinned than the rest of her relatives. And I learned as she talked to me that her father was from the Atlantic coast, was a descendant of escaped slaves, and that people on the Atlantic coast were not treated kindly by those on the mainland. And maybe because she knew that I could relate to some of her experience, maybe because she was excited to see an American of her skin tone that understood her language, I'm not sure. But she spent the next hour talking to me about how much pain she feels, how much rejection she feels because of who she is in terms of race and ethnicity from her own family and from her own country. The history of Dominican Republic is rife with racism, including a dictator that was um, leading the country for about 30 years and slaughtered thousands upon thousands of Haitians in what is known as Massacre River because they are black. And the irony upon ironies is that he was a descendant of some of those same Haitians. The self-hatred, the hating of your own color, the hating of your own history because of racism and colonization and the institutionalized forms of racism in Latin America and specifically the Dominican Republic. So I grew up hearing, you are not black. Don't say that you are black. I remember I was having uh, just some, uh, some friends over. We were playing baseball together in our backyards. Two very light-skinned Dominicans, and we were just in conversation. I was like six or seven years old, and at some point they start laughing at me, and I ask them, why are you laughing? And they said, because you're black. From the same island, both of our grandmothers, about the same skin tone, they were on the lighter side, and I was not. And you all see I'm not even that dark. I had to learn to claim my African heritage. I had to learn to claim my blackness in spite of all the messaging that I learned or picked up from my parents, my grandparents, from messaging coming through my own country of origin, places where, or a place where women are expected to straighten their hair even from a young age, because no one wants to appear to be too black, where we're told, stay out of the sun, marry white women so that your children will have better hair. I am becoming now a proud Afro-Latino. My parents moved us to Michigan in the early 1990s. I think it was actually 1990. About four years old. My dad moved to New York when he was in his early 20s, married my mother who was there from her early tweens. Me and my two older sisters were born in Brooklyn, New York. And my parents wanting to experience life outside of the major city actually moved down south, moved to Fort Smith, Arkansas, discovered that America is in fact racist, and decided to move back up north, but not to Michigan. And because my father knew some Dominicans in Grand Rapids at the time, we ended up in Grand Rapids, and he found some factory work. My grandmother from my mom's side, my dear Abuelita Lina, also moved to Grand Rapids from New York, along with my aunt, and they lived in an apartment here downtown. This next poem I'm going to read is called Aquí in Michigan, which means here in Michigan. Hace calor, 
abuelita says. We find her in the kitchen of the apartment wearing nothing but a bra and a half slip. Mommy, Thea gasps. I laugh and laugh and laugh. Sixty years old and sixty. Adjusting to this new place, the white people keep telling us it's not the heat, it's the humidity that'll kill you. Abuelita doesn't know the difference leaning over the stove to stir a pot of pinto beans. The Weston apartments are home for Abuelita, Tia too. They are downtown or uptown, depending on who you ask. I asked Tia, why does the elevator smell like pee? Every time we go up and down. Sometimes she doesn't answer. Once she points to a puddle in the back corner and I've never felt more trapped as we waited for that door to open again. We left Nueva York for this place, Grand Rapids, Michigan. More opportunities, Thea explains. We ignore the boarded up buildings and meander toward what she calls La Plaza. The summer flows from the concrete, the last summer before I start first grade, 1991. Did you go to school, Tia, in Puerto Rico? She takes my hand and tells me about walking through butterfly fields on her way home from class, her and her friends climbing mango trees. It's time to go home for dinner, this new home. The elevator climbs up again. Abuelita greets us, arroz and habichuelas. There is a twinkle in her green eyes. She tells me to bless the food. English is okay, she says, but I pray in Spanish, and God listens. I am what is called a second generation immigrant, meaning my parents immigrated to the United States, and so I am um, a product of their moving here with U United States citizenship, um, but experiencing what is called living in the hyphen. Um, Daniel A. Rodriguez describes this interaction, this mix between English and Span Spanish as Spanglish. It's much more than what we speak. It's a metaphor for what we are doing, for how we act and how we perceive the world. In other words, Spanglish is another way to identify where we live in the hyphen. Spanglish is the ultimate space where the in-betweenness of being neither Latin American nor North American is negotiated. When we speak in Spanglish, we are expressing not ambivalence, but a new region of discourse that has the possibility of redefining ourselves in the mainstream, as well as negotiating the conventional wisdom of assimilation and Americanness. And here I return to that feeling of what does it feel like to be a problem? Not Latin American enough to be Latin American, certainly not American enough to be fully American. And so I continually am asked the question, what are you? Where are you from? And where are you really from? and owning the fact that I live in this hyphen in the in-between space between both worlds, owning that is a process. It's part of what is also known as being a third culture kid. A third culture kid is a person who has spent a significant part of his or her or their development years outside the parent's culture. The TCK frequently builds relationships to all of the cultures while not having fully a full ownership in any. Although elements from each culture may be assimilated into the TCK's life experience, the sense of belonging is in relationship to others of a similar background. And it's funny because before I found this definition several years ago, I was having trouble describing what this felt like. That I find my home 
with other third culture kids, more specifically those from Latin America, um, from a Latin American heritage, where we don't belong anywhere, where we're not fully accepted and have to pave our own way in this world we call Spanglish. I am still becoming a proud Latino and a proud American. So Aaron, um, in, my, in that introduction, uh, mentioned that I am the executive director of a nonprofit called New City Neighbors. New City Neighbors is um, a faith-based organization, doesn't do any proselytizing, but it operates in an avenue of social justice through urban farming and um, food access while empowering youth. As you can see um, in this picture, this is part of what used to be our farm, and I'll go into what that means in a moment. But let me offer one last poem and reflection of this part of my life before I say any more. Garden. Meet me in the garden, where I dig my knees into the dirt, praying, where my brow sweat falls to the earth that waits with its mouth open, hoping to see the children of God revealed. They told me I could be anything, so I chose to be me. They told me I could be everything, but I chose to be free. They told me, oh, I'm sorry, they handed me a shovel, asked me if I wouldn't change my mind. Silence. They told me get to digging with everybody watching, everybody waiting for a revolution, and everybody take to falling asleep. Silence, but not me. I am getting ready to be planted, and if this brown body has to die, then so be it. All morning I threw dirt over my shoulder, hauled then a few rocks, a boulder, till I could stand waist deep in their sin. Did it all day till the sun faded its rays, till till I was ready to lay me down to become the garden, full of tiger lilies and an oak tree that will shade the hunger of a generation yet to be created. So here I pray as you walk away, talking about my potential to grow. And now I lay, cross my arms over my chest, ready for this blessed rest, but eyes always wide open. Silence. I wait. Silence. Will anyone bury me? Then the earth shudders. I hear the voice. Not yet. This last part of my story that I'll share in becoming who I am comes with a lot of pain, if I'm honest. So as the title suggests, I am, in fact, gay. And I don't have a wife. I have a husband. And I cannot tell you how many times I've gone into faith-based spaces where I have been asked the question, where is your wife? It's this interesting space to inhabit for me, um, this feeling like a problem. When I enter into leadership in a city where I'm not necessarily welcomed, not only because of what I bring as an Afro-Latino, someone from the hood, but also because I am pretty loud about being gay. 
and I've learned to be loud about it as a defense mechanism so that I don't have to worry about what someone might say regarding me later if they find out in a different way. So in 2019, I started working at this place called New City Neighbors, um, wonderful organization in the Creston neighborhood. Um, I had heard about it from a friend and I sort of kept tabs on it from afar and when I was looking to do more community-based work more directly, um, I remember getting an email with New City Neighbors announcing that they're looking for an executive director. And so I decided to apply. Having never been on the property, I'd only seen some of the things that they had done through social media, um, through word of mouth. And when I arrived in the space that they were leasing to do their urban farm, I was stunned. It blew my socks off. There was this huge three, well, two and a half to three acre farm in the middle of the city. And it was surrounded by purple and yellow cone, cone flowers. There were bees and butterflies flooding around. And because I had arrived early for my interview, I decided to just walk through the field. And I saw summer squash, peppers, tomatoes, kale, lettuce, all sorts of healthy goodness. And I was just stunned that this Garden of Eden was in the middle of this neighborhood called Creston. I applied for the position, um, got the interview, went through a second round of interviews, went through a third round, eventually was offered the position. And as soon as I came in as a full-time executive director of this organization in December of 2019, I was immediately hit with an email from its number one partner saying that we were no longer welcome on the property, um, that we would have to relocate, that the, the partnership would need to be dissolved. Now, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, um, but essentially um, what had happened, what had happened was, um, the farm was being leased off the property of a church. And that church, having discovered or heard that I am gay and was hired as the executive director, even though I have two Bible degrees and lead a local church, we were told that the, depart the partnership would be dissolved and we would have to relocate. And so after some serious conversation and some negotiation a little bit, um, we were able to stay on the property a bit longer until we could, we could make a healthy transition. But jobs were in jeopardy. Um, we, we hired, uh, we tend to hire up to 20 youth a summer. Um, we had um, adult staff as well. Um, we were trying to rebuild some programs after some financial hardship. A lot of the food went to um, local food pantries or food resource centers, and all of that was put into jeopardy because of who I am and because I decided to live my life out loud. And so this is how that farm looks today. Now, to be clear, New City Neighbors is still alive and well, and we have three different farm sites and not just the original one, which you see here. But this is part of the intersection that I live in, answering the question, what does it feel like to be a problem? And how am I becoming who I am? How am I becoming me and becoming me out loud? There are no easy answers, but what it says is that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of standing up for yourself, claiming your identity, despite the many things that might have been thrown your way or continue to be thrown your way. And so I do live my life out loud as a proud Afro-Latino gay in, a pla in places where I'm not often welcomed. And so I want to go back to this question, 
Who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? Thinking through systemic racism, thinking through gender identity, sexual orientation, expression, all the above and more. Who are you becoming? And will you take the opportunity to live that life out loud? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing your life and your story um, and, and all of those different pieces and parts of you. Um, thank you very much. I want to open up the floor for questions from the room or also uh, from our YouTube friends and family. If there's anyone um, in the comment section in YouTube that has questions or comments or thoughts, um, I am opening the floor. We're waiting for YouTube to update. So you mentioned you do a lot of different forms of art. Is there one that you feel the most drawn to or in spend most of your time on, or do you just do it all equally? Um, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I don't have one that I'm particularly drawn to more than the other. Um, so I do drawing um, with charcoal, regular pencil, painting, um, mostly watercolor photography. Um, but all my life, I, while drawing and, and art and all of that is something that, that I love, actually writing has been consistently something that has followed me. Um, and so leaning into short story writing, um, essays, um, poetry, that's where I find myself often um, feeling free in terms of playing with words and language. Thank you so much for sharing your story today. It was so inspiring and many things that I feel like I could relate to, especially that where are you from and where are you really from questioning that othering. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what your kind of greatest hope is right now for mm. fostering belonging in Grand Rapids for people who experience that othering. Yeah. Um, I actually have the opportunity to... Um, sort of oversee a leadership program that we're participating in at New City Neighbors. And so my greatest hope has been and continues to be that a new generation of leaders with um, a fresher perspective, um, less of the baggage that my generation has carried, that they would be able to engage um, and, and shape their world. And so when I see um, two people that I've mentored leading a group of young people and mentoring them in terms of learning about asset mapping, civic engagement, um, diversity and equity um, and inclusion, um, learning local history, um, talking about food scarcity. Like that to me is just, yes. Like lifting up local leaders that will be able to solve their problems without waiting for someone to parachute in with money or whatever, that they will be able to um, learn how to manage the resources around them and create long-term solutions. Yeah. I can come up with stuff. Um, if there was, I guess, anything that you would say to your grandmother, to Abuela, about her self-hatred, mm -hmm. what would you say? You know, that's, that's a hard one because it's like, what? First of all, you couldn't tell grandma nothing because <laughs> um, she wasn't having it. But I, I wish I had taken more time to just tell my grandmother that she's beautiful. 
right? When I would hear things like that, when she would say, I mean, she would make fun of herself. She a lot of self-deprecation about the size of her nose, her eyebrows, um, her hair texture. Um, yeah, I wish I had told her more often that she is a beautiful black woman. Is there anything that you did not get to share that you want to share? Anything that maybe ended up on the cutting room floor? Yeah, actually there was a lot that was left on the cutting room floor. Um, so, I actually, I won't, if I go into my notes, I'm going to say a whole lot more than what we have time for. So let me not look at that. Um, I wish that we would spend more time, um, or I don't know. So I, I grew up in um, in a school. I actually had a, a really wonderful privilege of growing up in in um, an elementary, going to an elementary school where most of the administration was African American. Um, a lot of the teachers were too, um, and so Black history was something that was shared with us all the time, but it was always very specific to the United States, um, which no complaints, but I wish that there would be more opportunities to learn um, in mainstream school about the African diaspora and talk about the beauty that is the black experience that has emerged um, in cultures around the world, right? Um, that we could look at you know, the dances from, from Brazil, that we could talk about um, the, the brave slaves that escaped and, and colonized the Atlantic coast, um, that we could um, just sort of open our mind to see um, more of that. And, you know, I have to often explain to people as well, I'm not African-American. I'm not trying to claim being African-American. That's not my story. That's not my heritage, right? But being black is because I come from a line of African slaves, right? And it's, it's in our music, it's in our food, it's in our dancing. And it's just so amazing that Dominican people would just, um, so many of them would uh, say that they're not, right? Um, that they would claim their, the colonial heritage over the African heritage. I mean, that's like a whole talk in and of itself. Um, but it's there and it's so rich and it's so beautiful. And if we could just own that um, and see the beauty of, of black expression in many different ways um, versus what we, we typically see, right? Which is um, the painful side. Um, and I'm not trying to dismiss that at all because my God, like there is some damage there. Um, it's gonna take us hundreds of years to climb out of it. Uh, but I just think that there's some of that uh, beauty and culture that's missed in the larger world. Thank you. Um, how did your experience in your time at GRCC shape who you are and who you are becoming? That's a great question as well. Um, I, I support and promote GRCC all the time in terms of uh, me interacting with youth and, and high schoolers. I will tell them, listen, don't feel like you have to go to a big school. GRCC is there. Um, it's not only cost effective, but you're going to have an enriching experience when you come here because there are people coming from all over the area, right? There's different ethnicities, ages, um, religions that are present. Um, and it's, for me, it was such a wonderful experience to be in a classroom um, with people from, from all over West Michigan um, and to learn from, from my peers. I um, have to uh, just give a shout out to David Cope who was the creative writing professor at the time um, when I was going here. And I loved his class so much, I took it twice. Um, and it was just the same content and it was amazing, right? Because it was just a place to hear from different people and their life experiences, um, just a myriad of different life experiences as they were trying to explore writing and become better writers and, and whatever um, type of writing they were engaging in. So um, I highly recommend GRCC to Anyone that's looking for a place for, for schooling, to take a class, to sharpen a skill, um, it has 
really paved the way for me in many aspects. So coming from an educational system where a lot of the people in leadership looked like you, mm -hmm. was there a bit of transition and culture shock kind of coming into a system where there's not as much of, of that visual uh, sameness? Absolutely. I talked about this in my GRCC story a little bit. My freshman year, I went to a larger university, um, and it was a terrible experience. So I grew up in um, immigrant African-American circles um, in Grand Rapids, went to um, Ottawa Hills High School, which was and still is a predominantly African-American high school. Um, you know, had a lot of great experiences there. And then when I went off to college my freshman year, I mean, it was, I was the only brown person in the room in many classrooms. And being a first generation college student as well, I'm the only one in terms of cousins, aunts, uncles um, that has graduated from college. So I was the first one to like go and do this thing. Um, it, was, it was intimidating. I experienced so many microaggressions. Um, I was already exploring like ideas of, of race and racism and systemic racism and trying to like navigate that for myself. Um, but that's sort of pushed me hard in that direction because of what I experienced. And so coming to a place like GRCC where, I mean, I don't know what the ratio is in terms of staff and ethnicity and what that breakdown is, but to at least be surrounded by peers and professionals um, of different backgrounds was helpful. Full disclosure, you and I are really good friends. <laughs> and I've heard a lot of this before. Okay. Should but I be worried? I don't think you need to be worried. But, <laughs> you know, growing up, and you and I have talked about a lot of things you've been through and good and bad. Yeah. Um, what's the one thing you'd want to go back and tell little Ricardo? Tell little Ricardo? Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Yeah. Um, I would probably encourage myself and say, don't be afraid to be who you are. Um, there was uh, my life experience in so many ways when I was younger was, was put into a box. Um, no shade on my parents, but, you know, they were immigrant parents and, you know, they had certain expectations, um, wanted me to be a doctor, to, um, to date a white person and all of that. Um, it was just, there was a lot of expectations that were put on me. And part of my becoming me was learning to shed those expectations. And I think I would have been so much more free if I had done that earlier, um, if I wasn't afraid to step out of that box, um, to see beyond what was just in front of me. Um, so yeah, that would be my encouragement to myself. All right. Thank you again. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for everyone who had questions or who watched and participated. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>